This is Coding Math, Episode 5, Arc Tangent. Now, in previous videos, I talked about the three main trig functions, sine, cosine, and tangent. Of those, sine and cosine have countless uses, and we've explored a few of those in Episodes 2 through 4. But as I mentioned, tangent is a bit of an outcast. First of all, the curve it defines looks like this, as opposed to the smooth up and down of sine or cosine waves. Secondly, from a programming viewpoint, the values that you get from tangent can approach positive and negative infinity and can be even undefined for certain values. So even if that curve had some usefulness, dealing with infinity and undefined in code can get a bit messy. So I'm not saying you'll never see tangent in code or never use it yourself, but you probably won't see it or use it very often. However, there is a function related to tangent that you'll find very useful in coding graphics, animation, and in particular interactivity, and that is arctangent. Arctangent is just the inverse of tangent. There's also arc sine and arc cosine, which are the inverse of sine and cosine. These are often abbreviated a sin, a cos, a tan. But sometimes you'll see them referred to as inverse sine, inverse cosine, and inverse tangent, and written like this. Sine to the negative one, cosine to the negative one, tangent to the negative one. I'll continue to use the arc terminology as it matches up with the names of JavaScript's math functions. Now to clarify what we mean by inverse, so we know that the sine of 30 degrees is 0 0.5. That simply means that the arc or inverse sine of 0 0.5 is 30 degrees. So if you know the lengths of any two sides of a right triangle, you can use arc sine, arc cosine, or arc tangent functions to find either or both of the non-right angles of the triangle. For example, let's take a coordinate system here. This is canvas, so the y-axis is flipped and the angles will go around clockwise. Now say we have a triangle like this. And we know that the hypotenuse is 100 units long, and this side here is 50 units long. And we need to know this angle here, angle A. Well, from the viewpoint of angle A, this side here would be the adjacent side. Well, we know that the adjacent over the hypotenuse is the cosine function, and here the adjacent 50 divided by the hypotenuse 100 is 0 0.5. So if we look up the arc cosine of 0 0.5, we find that it equals 60 degrees. So angle A is equal to 60 degrees. Of course, keep in mind, when you're doing this with code, you'd be getting back radians, not degrees. Now, all that said, you probably won't find yourself using arc cosine and arc sine very often. They do have the uses, so it's good to know them, and they will come in handy now and then, but arc tangent is the one you're really going to find useful. So why is arc tangent so useful? Okay, here we have a point on the screen. Maybe this is the position of an object, like an arrow, that you're drawing to the canvas. And over here we have another point. Say this is the position of the mouse pointer. Now say we want to rotate this arrow so that it's always pointing at the mouse pointer. Well, we can draw a triangle here like this, and what we want to know is this angle. If we rotate the arrow to that angle, it will be pointing directly at the mouse pointer. Now say this arrow is sitting at 400 on the x-axis and 400 on the y-axis. And the mouse pointer over here is, say, 600 on x and 500 on y. Well, the distance between the two is 200 on the x-axis, 600 minus 400 and 100 on the y-axis, 500 minus 400. So we now know the lengths of the opposite side and the adjacent sides. And which trig function is the ratio between the opposite and adjacent? Tangent. So we can get the ratio of these two sides, pass that ratio to arc tangent, and get this angle. If you're interested, the ratio is 0 0.5, and the arc tangent of that is about 26.57 degrees. Now before we start coding this up, I need to go over canvas transformations. We're going to want to draw this arrow on a canvas at a specific point and rotate it to a certain direction. There are two possible strategies here. We could use some math to draw a rotated arrow at that position, or we could use canvas transformations to translate and rotate the canvas and then draw the arrow. We'll go with the latter. First we'll want to translate the drawing context to move 0, 0, the origin, to the point where we want to draw the arrow. Normally 0, 0 is up here on the canvas, with the coordinate system positioned like this. We call context translate, passing in x and y values of where we want to draw the arrow. Now the context coordinate system is centered there. We did something similar in video 2. Next, we call context rotate, passing in an angle in radians. Note, this does not actually rotate the canvas, but rotates the coordinate system so that it looks like this. Now, if we draw a plain right-pointing arrow centered at 0, 0, it will be drawn to the canvas to look like this. 
Now, the order of those operations is very important. First translate, and then rotate. If you did them in the opposite order, you'd get very different results. Now, we'll be drawing over and over again repeatedly, with different rotation angles, and possibly different positions for the arrow. So to keep things clean, we'll save the untransformed context, do our transformations, then do the drawing, and then restore the context back to its original state. Okay, now we're ready to write some real code. We'll start out with the usual HTML and JavaScript files and the usual note to refer to episode 1 if you have any questions about how or why things are set up as they are. First we'll define some variables. Arrow X and arrow Y will define where we want the arrow to be drawn. This will be the center of the canvas for now. Then DX and DY, which will be the distance between the arrow and the mouse on each axis. And finally, angle, which we'll set to zero at start, but will eventually be calculated based on the mouse position. Now we can call and create a render function. This is mostly the code I just described, saving the context, transforming it, and drawing the arrow. The arrow is just three straight lines, so it's a begin path, three pairs of move twos and line twos, and then a stroke. Then we restore the context, and finally we call request animation frame, passing in render. This will call render over and over, sync to the screen refresh, as described in episode 3. Now we can test this, and sure enough we have an arrow at the center of the screen pointing to an angle of zero. So we're off to a good start. Now let's make it point to the mouse. The strategy will be to listen for when the mouse moves, get its position, and calculate an updated value for angle. The drawing itself will continue to happen in the render function, which won't need to change. We'll add an event listener for the mouse move event and create a function to handle it. This function gets passed an event object. This object will have a bunch of properties relating to the event that just occurred. The ones that we'll be interested in are client x and client y, which will be the position of the mouse pointer in relation to the browser content area. Now we're lucky here because we've gotten rid of any padding and margins, and the canvas is sitting at exactly 0, 0, so the coordinate systems will match up correctly. If the canvas weren't at exactly 0, 0, you'd need to adjust the client x and client y values to allow for that, but that's beyond the scope of this video. Now we can find dx and dy by subtracting the arrow position from the mouse position on each axis. And finally we use math a tan, the arctangent function, to get the angle. This takes a ratio of opposite over adjacent. So referring back to the drawing we made at the start of the video, dy is the opposite side, and dx is the adjacent. So we say angle equals math a tan dy divided by dx. Now when we test this, the arrow is drawn repeatedly based on the current angle, and the angle is updated whenever the mouse moves. Well, at first it seems to work okay, but when we move the mouse over here to the left, suddenly the arrow is pointing in the opposite direction. In fact, it's always pointing to the right. It will never follow the mouse over to the left side of the screen. To figure out what's wrong, let's literally go back to the drawing board. Now when the mouse is down here, both dx and dy are positive, so dy divided by dx is positive. When we move up into this quadrant, dy is negative, so dy over dx is negative. Then down in the bottom left quadrant, dx is negative and dy is positive, so the ratio is negative again. But then, up in the top left, both dy and dx are negative. So the ratio is positive. Now the math a tan function doesn't know which quadrant you're in. If you pass in minus 0.5, for example, it doesn't know if that's the result of a minus x and plus y or a minus y and plus x. So it limits the angles it returns to these two quadrants. That's why the arrow always points to the right. Now you could do some conditional logic to correct this, since you know which is which. But there is a simpler solution. The solution is to use the math a tan 2 function, one of the most originally named functions in the language. Instead of a simple ratio, you pass in the x and y values individually. Now that it has the data on which are positive and negative, it can make sure that it gives back a result that always makes sense. Now one thing to keep in mind here is that the order of the arguments is y first and then x, as opposed to what you might expect x, y. So you say math a tan 2 y comma x. Now we can go back to our code and change that math a tan dy divided by dx to math a tan 2 dy comma dx. Now we can test this again and it all works as expected. Now realize that this is all completely dynamic. You can move the arrow around by changing the position of arrow x and arrow y and it will all still work. 
Here I've used some of the code from episode 4 to move the arrow around in a circle. You can see that no matter where the arrow is, and no matter where the mouse pointer is, the arrow always points straight at the mouse. So that's all for this episode. Hopefully that was useful to you. I'll be back next week with a new video. I'm going to shoot for getting these out once a week, probably on Monday. I have a good list of subjects I want to cover, lots of exciting stuff, but if you have any suggestions, comment away, and I'll see what I can do.